This video that you're seeing now is a full Inkscape mini course that I made a while ago. I frequently use it as a section on my other Inkscape related courses as the basics of the program. But now I decided to share it with you in its entirety here on the channel. I will start uploading some of my old courses here. The older ones are gonna be complete and some of the newer ones that are still on sale might be a bit trimmed down but still complete on their own. So if you're interested in Inkscape or Vector Illustration, I would recommend you to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss them. And of course, please give this video a thumbs up so YouTube will want to show it to the highest amount of people possible. I'll try to upload something new at least once a week, though it might not always be a full course. A couple of warnings. This course has a few years, and here I'm using an old version of Inkscape. I think it's uh, the 0.92. For the most part, the interface and the functionality is exactly the same, but there may be some minor changes here and there, mostly to the interface. Nothing that will invalidate anything in this course. Another thing, the individual lessons are separated by timestamps, so check the description to skip around. And one final thing, the course originally included some resources, some links and exercises that I briefly mentioned in one of the lessons, they are not needed at all, but if you want to check them out, including the exercises, I'll let you know that you can support me and the channel by getting my entire collection of 10 courses, including all the resources and extras, at a special price, and the link is in the description below. Other than that, hope you enjoyed, and tell me in the comments what you think. If there's enough demand, I will remake this course with the latest version of Inkscape. So please let me know in the comments if that's something you'd like. In this lesson I want you to get familiar with the user interface. This way, by the end of the lesson, at least you'll have some general idea of what each of these bars and buttons do, or at least how they are organized. Because I know all these tiny buttons all together can get to be pretty confusing, especially if you've never worked in a vector software before. But the first step is getting the program. Inkscape is a free open source software, which means that you can download for free the latest version in the official page inkscape.org. Once there, just go to the section that says Downloads. There you'll see a list of multiple download options. Just pick the one that fits your operative system, then download it and install it. Once you open the program for the first time, this is what you're gonna see. This is the default user interface. So what I'm gonna do now is gonna be going one by one and give you a quick and loose idea of what each of these UI elements do. Later on, as we move on with the course, I'll go more in depth into the relevant bars and buttons. The first UI element you're gonna notice is gonna be this big white area with this black rectangle in the middle. This is the drawing area. This is where you'll be making your illustrations. This area is way bigger than it looks. It extends virtually infinitely in all directions. So you have a lot of space to draw whatever you want. As far as the black rectangle, this is a guide the program creates by default in all new documents. So it's gonna appear in every new document you create. This guide is here because Inkscape is a vector illustration software and these types of programs are mostly used for graphic design. So this guide is made for the creation of PDFs, cards, brochures and that kind of stuff, where it's helpful to have a clearly defined border. But for what will be using it, digital drawing, you can safely ignore it and draw whatever you want in the white area. This highlighted bar is called the comments bar, and it has a lot of shortcuts to the most common actions of the program, like open and save files, copy paste, new document, and that type of stuff. This vertical bar is called the snap bar, and it has a lot of options related to snapping. So you can position shapes with more accuracy, depending on the type of drawing you may want it enabled or not. And you can toggle all snapping on and off with the first button. I recommend you that, for now, 
you disable all snapping altogether, at least while you're still learning, because it can bother you later on when you start to move shapes around and the shapes start snapping to everything accidentally. So I recommend you to disable it now to avoid future problems. This element right here with a lot of tiny squares is called the palette. If you have a selected object, you can give it a color by clicking on any of these swatches. If you use the scroll bars, you see that you have a ton of colors to pick. Below the palette is the status bar. This bar shows a few important options regarding the document, like selected colors, zoom, current layer, and it even shows you some really nice tips and shortcuts as you go using the tools. The ruler is this element that's stuck to the left and upper side of the drawing area. This element marks the position of the pointer with a ruler and numbers. This ruler can get to be useful if you are working in something related to the graphic design area, but for illustration it's pretty much useless. As far as the scroll bars, they are completely useless. They allow you to pan the document, but as we'll see in a minute, the best way to move around in the document is by using shortcuts. Finally, the two most important elements in the user interface, other than the drawing area. The toolbox, which is this vertical bar that has all the tools you'll be using to draw anything. Later on, we'll be seeing the most important tools, so you'll get pretty familiar with it. And then is the tool controls bar, which has the options of the currently selected tool. So they kind of work together with the toolbox. Sadly, Inkscape doesn't offer much as far as UI customization goes. All the elements are basically stuck where they are. So you'll have to get used to it, like it or not. However, you do have the option of hiding each of these elements we just saw if you go to View and then Show Hide. Here you'll see this list with the names of all the elements. Right next to the name, there is this check mark which shows which ones are activated. Just to show you, I'm going to hide them all so you can see how the interface looks without any element. Now all the elements have been hidden, all but the drawing area, which is pointless to hide, and of course the main menu. If you have space problems due to the low resolution of your screen, or if you want a slightly bigger drawing area, or maybe if you're going for a more minimalistic UI, there are a few elements that I consider to be safe to hide for almost all drawing projects. The commands bar, the one with the shortcuts to the basic actions, that's safe to hide. Worst case scenario, you will have to make a couple of extra clicks to open the main menu without those shortcuts. It's also safe to hide the ruler and the scroll bars. Like I say, those elements are not the most useful for drawing and illustration. And if you want, you can also hide the status bar, though some of the tips and shortcuts that shows when you pick a tool can be helpful for a beginner. There's one last customization option, and this allows you to switch the position of the commands bar and the snap bar. If you go to the view menu, down here you'll see these three options, default, custom, and wide. The default option leaves the commands bar on top and the snap bar on the right, vertically. The custom option leaves both bar on top and the wide option both on the right, vertically. It's not much, but it can help you in case you're working on a low resolution screen and you don't want to hide anything. The rest of the options of the program are handled by using dockable dialogues. In Inkscape, dockable dialogues are floating windows that you can open and close and can be docked to the right and they have comments and options related to a particular area. There are a ton of dialogues, pretty much every big important area of the program has a dedicated dialogue, ranging from, the, ranging from color selection to document options. We'll go more in depth into particular dialogues as we move along, but for now I want to show you how the UI works, so I'm just gonna open a random dialogue by going to the top menu. And you can see when a menu will open up a dockable dialog when it has these three dots at the end. 
So I'm going to open the objects dialog. This dialog contains information about the individual objects in the document. By default, the first time you open a dialog, it will be docked to the right of the main windows. Remember that all dockable dialogs are floating dialogs, so if you click in the title, you can drag it off. You can leave it floating there. Then, if you want, you can dock it right back by moving it to the right side. Keep in mind that you can only dock dialogs to the right side. You cannot dock them anywhere else. If you open more than one dialog, they'll start to stack into columns, one on top of another. If there is no more vertical space when you stack multiple dialogs, the body of the dialog will hide automatically, and this little bar with the dialog title will appear. If you click on it, the dialog will swap with the one that's showing. If you don't need a dialog anymore, you can close it with the X button in the title. Closed dialogs will retain the options that you may have set. You can also click on this little arrow in the title and convert it into a bar on the right. That's vertical. This will help you to save space and keep the dialog there ready to be opened again. Now if you want to show it, just click on the icon. Before ending this lesson, I want to show you how to use the shortcuts to move in the document. When you're drawing, you're going to have to constantly move from one side to another as you go building your drawings. So it's very important to learn the shortcuts so moving in the document becomes second nature. Lucky for us, you only need to know two shortcuts, and they are really easy to learn. To pan the camera, just hold the middle mouse button and move it. You're going to see how the guide rectangle moves side to side as the camera moves. If you have an actual drawing in the document, you will see it moving as the view of the document changes. If you don't have a middle mouse button, you can also use the spacebar. The other type of camera movement is the zoom. The zoom is extremely important. Remember that we are working with vectors, which means that due to the resolution independent shapes, as you draw, you'll be constantly wanting to zoom to work in a particular area, to a detail. Zooming is really easy. Just hold control and move the mouse wheel up or down, depending on if you want to zoom in or out. A really nice detail is that when you are zooming in, you zoom to the position of the pointer. So if you want to go to a particular area, just move the pointer there and zoom in. If you don't have a mouse with wheel, you can zoom in and out with the plus and minus keys, though this way you only zoom to the center of the document. And that's it for the user interface of Inkscape. Hopefully the program won't look as intimidating now. Before we begin with the tools you'll be using to draw, first you have to understand the way to build your drawings using Inkscape. As you may know, Inkscape is a vector illustration software, and vector illustration is considerably different than traditional drawing. In traditional drawing, using either pen and paper or a drawing tablet, you draw using lines that outline the shapes you want your drawing to have. This way is by far the most flexible way to draw. You can make a square, cube or figure with the same level of effort. On the other hand, when you draw with a vector software, you build your own shapes and then you stack them one on top of another, till you build your final illustration. This workflow is meant to be used to create what Vector software were originally made to do graphic design, where most of the illustrations are made of flat and simple geometrical shapes. And this way of working strongly influences the type of drawing you'll be making, flat and graphical cartoony drawings with simple forms and silhouettes are way easier to make with the tools the program has than complex expressive three-dimensional ones. However, the benefit of working in a vector software has more to do with convenience than artistic potential. It's way easier, faster and effective to use the mouse directly 
on the program to draw a simple cartoony character, then draw in it on pen and paper and then scan and refine the image to then draw on top from the beginning. Maybe with an example things will be clearer. What you are seeing right now is a tree that I drew for a course of mine on background design using Inkscape. This tree is built of four different shapes. First is the trunk, which is simply an elongated triangle. Then the branches, which are also elongated triangles. Then the leaves, which are triangles that I curve the edges a bit. And then the shadow, which is a slightly more complex shape. As you can see, the tree consists of geometrical shapes. Scaled, skewed and modified, but 100% simple geometrical shapes stacked one on top of another. And the great thing about working like this is that it is extremely easy to create variations. For example, this is the end result of the project of the background design course. All these trees that are in there are copies of the original that I just changed the color and modified the position of some of the forms. And the end result is that a large part of these woods were made with a single tree in minutes. To be able to draw this way, you need two things. First, a way to create your own shapes, in the case of the trees, the different triangles and the shape of the shadow. And second, obviously, a way to manipulate those shapes. To move them, rotate them, duplicate them and stack them. For example, in the case of the tree, I just drew a single shape for the leaves. And the other ones were duplicated, moved and scaled into position. In this lesson, you're going to learn how to do the second, how to manipulate objects. But in order to manipulate objects, first you need to be able to create objects. Luckily, Inkscape comes with four geometric shape tools that allows you to create objects fast and easy. They are the rectangle tool, the ellipse tool, the star tool, and the spiral tool. As a side note, there are also the tools that allows you to create your own custom shapes, but they are a bit more complex and we're going to be seeing them later. So click in any of them in the toolbox and you're going to see that the pointer changes. Now it has the shape of the tool that you picked. In my case, it has the shape of the rectangle. Now you can draw your shape. Simply click and drag. Once drawn, you're going to see this dotted marquee with these tiny shapes in the borders. This means that the shape is selected. These tiny shapes in the borders are the modifiers and they allow you to make some basic modifications depending on the shape. In the case of the rectangle, if you click on the squares, you'll be able to change the width and length. And if you click in the little circle, you'll be able to round off the edges. Both operations are very common and you're going to be using them all the time. Each shape tool has different basic operations. I recommend you to play around with each tool and see what each does. You will be surprised to know how useful and flexible it can be a simple rectangle and ellipse. You don't pay attention to the huge amount of objects that have rectangular or elliptical shapes till you start using these tools to draw. The first two tools, the rectangle and ellipse tool, you're going to be using them in 99% of all the drawings you'll be making. Because as we'll be seeing in the next lesson, they are very easy to modify and easy to use to create different shapes. As far as the other two, the polygon and the spiral, usually you'll be using them whenever you need a star or a spiral. So they have a limited use. Now that you know how to create objects, we can take a look at the main tool for handling them the object selection tool. This tool is one of the most important in the entire program and you'll be using it constantly. It allows you to do pretty much everything you may want with objects. You can select them, erase them, move, rotate, scale, duplicate and a lot of other essential operations that you'll be using in all illustrations. Let's start with the most basic. Select the tool and click in any object in the canvas. If you don't have any object, draw a few with the shape tools. Once you click on one, you'll see this dotted rectangle with these arrows in the corners. This means that the object is selected. 
there are operations that are only possible to make when you have a object selected. To unselect an object, just click outside in any empty area of the canvas. It is also possible to select multiple objects. This is really useful to apply an operation to multiple objects at the same time. To do this, just click on an empty area and drag. You're gonna see this rectangle. All objects that are fully covered by this rectangle will be selected. Alternatively, you can hold the Shift key and click on New Objects to add to a selection. To move an object, click and drag. It's not necessary that the object is selected beforehand, you can just click on an object and move. It is also possible to move multiple objects at the same time. To do this, first select the object you want to move, and then click on any of them and drag. The objects are going to maintain the relative distance between them. One of the most common operations you'll be doing is to delete objects. To delete an object, first select it, and then hit the delete key. It's very common that you want to duplicate an object or group of objects. It's really easy. First select the object or objects, and then hit Ctrl plus D. An exact copy of the selected object is going to be created on top of the old one, and it's going to be automatically selected. So it kind of looks like nothing happened, but if you move this object, you'll see that the old one is down there. The little arrows that appears when you select an object are really important. They allow you to scale an object in the direction of the arrow, that is to stretch or shrink in the direction of the selected arrow. Simply click on any of the arrows and move the mouse. If you click on a selected object without moving the mouse for a second time, you see a different group of arrows. With the arrows in the corners, you're going to be able to rotate the object. No matter which one you pick, the rotation pivot will always be in the center. The arrows in the middle, the one that points to both sides, allows you to skew the object from the center as well. And these were the basic operations you need to know about the object selection tool. But there is one more essential operation to manipulate objects that you need to know but it is in the tool controls bar. If you remember from the previous lesson, all tools have a group of options that are displayed in this bar right here. Even the shape tools that we saw a minute ago had options in this bar, though not any one that was worth to mention. The object selection tool has a couple of important options worth checking out. And just like everything I'm showing you here, I recommend you to stop the video and get to play and see what you can discover. If you let the pointer on any of these options, a tooltip will appear telling you more or less what each does. However, the ones that we'll be seeing now are these four buttons over here, that are grouped by these separators. These four buttons allow you to change the stacking order of a selected object. Let me explain you. As I said a minute ago, when you draw using vectors, you draw creating shapes and then stacking them one on top of another. Each created object has a stacking order number, which identifies which object is on top of which. By default, Inkscape places the last created object on top of the stack, but as you may have guessed, eventually you'll need to change the order of a couple of objects. For example, in the case of the tree I showed you in the beginning, the trunk is on top of the leaves and the branches on top of the trunk and the shadow is on top of everything. But I didn't originally made it like this. To me, it was easier to draw the trunk first, and then draw the leaves accordingly. When I drew the leaves, Inkscape obviously put them on top of the trunk, so I had to move them below by using these buttons. The first and last button of the group allows you to move the object to the bottom or top of the stack. Very useful if you have a lot of objects and the two in the middle allows you to move a position up or down in the stack. 
This 4 button lets you draw without the need to keep in mind the order in which you draw your shapes. Practically every illustration you'll ever do will need you to arrange the stack position of a couple of objects. Now I want to show you a few really important and useful shortcuts to use with the object selection tool. Now I won't be going over all the shortcuts, cause they are a lot. If you are interested you should check the Inkscape manual. But I am gonna show you the essential ones that you'll be using all the time. It's possible to move the selected objects with the arrow keys in the keyboard. This will move the object just a bit. This is great to make some minor adjustments to the position of objects. However, if you need, by holding shift, the object will move a greater quantity. It's very common that you may want to select an object that's obscured almost completely by another. You can select an object directly below a selected one by holding the Alt key and clicking where it should be. Or even better, move the mouse to be on top of the stacked objects, hold Alt and use the mouse wheel to highlight the object you want. These ones are really important to the creation of shapes. You can make the scaling of an object uniform. This is useful for maintaining the proportions when scaling. Just hold the control key and scale using any of the arrows. If on the other hand you are rotating or skewing an object with the other group of arrows, holding control will snap the transformation to a fixed angle. This is most useful with the rotation since it will snap to common angles like 45 degrees or 90 degrees or so. There is the shift key. When scaling this will automatically change the scaling pivot to the center rather than the opposite side of the selected arrow. And if you're using shift to rotate or skew, where the pivot point is already in the center, then it will move it to the opposite side rather than the center. So the shift key kinda inverts the pivot point position from center to corner and back. Of course you can also use both control and shift together. A very important detail is that both the control and shift shortcuts work at the moment of dragging to create a built-in shape. So you can easily drag a perfect circle with the ellipse tool if you hold control or drag rectangles from the center if you hold shift, or create perfect squares from the center if you hold both at the same time. Before ending this lesson, I want to talk very briefly about a very important subject related to objects, and that is color selection. Because color works slightly differently in a vector software application, and it may require a quick explanation. In Inkscape, all shape objects, with no exception, have these two properties, a fill and a border that surrounds that fill. To these two properties you can assign them color, gradient, patterns, textures, and you can even make them invisible. But some of these options are a bit more advanced, so for now let me show you how to give your objects fill and stroke any color. In order to do that, you're gonna be using the palette element. It's really easy. First you select your object, and then you click on any of the swatches. This is gonna assign the color to the object's fill. There are a lot to choose. If you move the scroll bars you see that you have hundreds of possible colors. Pretty much every color you may ever need. It's also possible to assign any of these colors to the stroke instead of the fill. Just hold shift and click on any swatch. But there's one of these swatches that has this weird symbol. The first one, the white one with this red X. This swatch has a unique function. By assigning this swatch to either the fill or stroke of an object, you'll make it invisible. As I said a moment ago, all objects, with no exception, have fill and stroke, so it's not possible to erase either, but it is possible to disable them temporarily. 
and that's what this swatch does. At least till you select another color and the fill stroke goes back to be visible. With these options you have a lot of control over the appearance of a shape, but the palette is more useful to quickly change colors. For a complete control over the way the shape looks, you're gonna have to use the fill and stroke dialog. This dialog not only allows you to pick between all possible colors, instead of the pre-selected swatches of the palette, but also allows you to change the stroke size, opacity and other appearance related properties. To open the dialog, go to Object, Fill and Stroke. The first thing you'll notice is that this dialog has three tabs, one to change the fill color, another identical for the stroke color, and a last one for the properties of the stroke. The first two tabs have exactly the same options, but depending on which one you use, the color will be set to either the fill or stroke of the selected object. Let's take a look at the options. So select an object and click on the first tab. We're gonna start by changing the fill. The first thing you'll notice are these 10 little buttons. These buttons set the type of painting that's gonna be applied to the fill or stroke. Don't worry, in real life you'll only be using the first two. You can safely ignore the other eight. The first button with the X is just like the first swatch in the palette. By selecting it, you disable the fill or stroke, depending on the tab you are. The button right next to it applies it a color, a bit like if you were to click in any of the other swatches in the palette. But the difference is that now you can see a group of options to pick the exact color you want. These five buttons here will change the mode with which you select a color. But I'm telling you right away, 99% of the time you'll be using the one that says wheel or the one that says HSL. You can forget about the others completely. For now, pick colors using the wheel mode. This color selection mode will display all possible colors, like the classic color wheel, with the hue on the outside and the saturation and lightness on the inner triangle. The last tab, the one that says Stroke Style, allows you to change the size of the border and a few other options. Again, there are a lot of options here, but the only one we care is the first one, the one with the label that says Width. Here you can set the stroke width you want with an input. Right next to the input, there is this drop down menu with different units with which you can pick the width. Picking the right unit is important, I recommend you to always pick the one that says PX, that is pixels. I believe that is the most comfortable and predictable unit to do any purely digital work. There are a couple of sliders that are independent of the tab you pick, one that says blur and another one that says opacity. The one that says blur will apply a blur to the selected objects. You're not gonna be using this option too much, except for specific cases. The slider that says opacity is a bit more important, it allows you to apply transparency to the entire object. With this dialog, now you're gonna be able to give any possible look to your shapes. Still, the palette has its place though. Usually you'll be using the palette to make super quick changes, and the fill and stroke dialog to do more deliberate changes, and also to change the stroke width. And that was all you need to know about objects for now. What you've learned in this lesson is the base for everything that will come later. With the knowledge you have now, you could try to make some basic illustrations. Of course, you still need to learn about the other half of vector illustration, how to create your own custom shapes. So for now, you'll be a bit limited of what you can do. But practice is essential. So I'm gonna leave you in the resources an Inkscape document with exercises designed to help you to completely master everything you've learned in this lesson. So I strongly recommend you to 
At least check this file before starting the next lesson. As I said in the previous lesson, knowing how to create and manipulate objects is half of what you need to be able to draw in InkShape. The other half is knowing how to create your own custom shapes. InkShape brings in these four basic built-in shapes that we saw in the previous lesson, but no matter how flexible the rectangle and ellipse are, sooner or later you're gonna need a unique shape to draw something you want. In this lesson I want you to learn everything regarding how to create and manipulate paths. Paths are the way InkShape handles the creation of your own shapes. The way paths works is gonna need a quick explanation. But I want you to know that paths, just like built-in shapes, are objects that can be manipulated with the object selection tool. So everything you've learned in the previous lesson applies to any path you make in this lesson. In InkShape, just like in most vector illustration software, paths are made of Bezier curves. A Bezier curve is a type of curve that's defined by the position of two nodes and the position of two handles attached to each node. By changing the position of the nodes, you change the starting and ending position. Each handle affects a certain quantity of the form the curve takes, depending on its position. This way, by changing the handles, you can give your curve any type of possible curvature between two points. You can even make a completely straight curve, if that makes sense. Don't worry if this feels a bit confusing. Once you start creating and manipulating curves, you're gonna see that it's way less complicated than it seems. But that's the way a single curve functions. What's interesting is that it's possible to attach one curve to the end of another, and repeat this till you close the shape by attaching a curve that joins the beginning and ending of the chain. And this way you create your own custom shape that's built by multiple curves, where each curve is a different section of the path. There are a few tools that allows you to build path directly. You have the pencil tool that allows you to create path by drawing them as if you were using an actual pencil. This tool is most useful with a tablet to draw more naturally. Then you have the calligraphy tool, again, more useful to create interesting looking strokes with a tablet. But the most important tool, not only in InkShape, but in most vector illustration software, is the pen tool. This tool is by far the most flexible and powerful of all the tools that creates paths. Because it allows you to create paths node by node. And because of this, you can build your own custom shapes with great control and accuracy with the mouse. Something that will be really hard to do with a traditional illustration software. So pick the pen tool. Now every time you click on the canvas, you're gonna place a node. Once you place the first node, you'll see this red line following the pointer. This line is there to help you previsualize the shape the curve is gonna take when you place the next node. You can place as much nodes as you want, and when you want to finish the path, click on the first node the one with the little white square, to close the path. Now you're no longer gonna be able to edit the path with the pen tool, the shape is finished and ready to be used. By default, the pen tool disables the handles when you click to place a node, so the nodes create this completely straight Bezier curve. Later on you'll see that this behavior is really useful to sketch shapes fast, but it is possible to place a handle when creating the nodes, in such a way that you introduce a curvature. When placing a node, just click and drag. You will see this handle that moves with the mouse. Pay attention to the previsualization line. It's gonna show you how the curvature is gonna be when you release the mouse. It's also possible to leave the path open. Simply place the nodes you want, and when you're done, right click. This is gonna finalize the path edition in the last place node. Now you can leave it like this, or if you want, you can append more sections by clicking on any of the end nodes with the pen tool, the ones with the little white squares. 
Whenever there is an open path, you can always keep adding more sections. Open paths are useful for a couple of things, but mostly to create lines. Here's an interesting tip when creating a path with the pen tool. When you create a node with a curvature, due to a property of the nodes that we're gonna see in a moment, sometimes the node is gonna force a curvature into the next section. You can see this in the previsualization line. So if you want to create a straight section connected to a curved section, a good tip is to deselect the path to end the editing in the last place node with the curvature, and then continue appending your straight sections from that end. With the pen tool, you should be able to draw pretty much everything you could with a real life pen or pencil. And this is the power of the pen tool. It gives the control and flexibility of a real life pen or pencil to your mouse. But the real power of the pen tool really starts showing when you use it with another tool, the node selection tool. The node selection tool is just like the object selection tool, but for paths. With this tool, you're gonna be able to do things like create, delete, and move nodes in a path, change the curvatures, and change the properties of individual nodes. In other words, it allows you to completely edit a path after it's being created, as you rarely are gonna draw a perfect path the first time around with the pen tool. Changing to this tool and retouch a path is a very common operation that you're gonna be doing all the time. That's why, just like the object selection tool, this tool is one of the most important tools in the program. To be able to edit a path, first you need a path. So create a quick path with the pen tool. This is important because the node selection tool won't work with built-in shapes unless you do something to them that we're gonna see later. To select a path is just like with the object selection tool. Click or drag a rectangle to select more than one. You're gonna see this dotted rectangle indicating that's selected. But you're also gonna see the nodes that makes up the path. Now, if you click in a node, you're selected. You can see that it's selected because it gets blue. Now, just like with the object selection tool, you can click and drag to move the node or select multiple nodes and move them all at the same time. Of course, it's not possible to rotate or scale a node. After all, a node is a single point. You can also try some of the object selection tool's shortcuts. One especially useful is the delete key to delete the selected nodes. Even more important is the possibility to add nodes to a path. You can add nodes in any location of a curve by double clicking. This will of course divide the curve where you place the nodes into two curves. This way you can completely change the overall shape of a path. But the one operation that really gives you a complete control over a path is the handle manipulation. When you click on a node, you're gonna be able to see the handles of that node. By clicking in the little circle at the end of the handle, you can move it, allowing you to completely change the curvature. Once you start to play around with paths, you probably notice that a couple of things. First, that nodes belonging to straight curves won't show a handle. And second, that some handles are stuck together with the curve right next to it. So when you move one handle in one side, the other side moves to the opposite side. Let's start by checking what's the deal with straight curve nodes. Straight curve nodes don't have handles because they are not needed. There is no curvature, so there is no need for handles. This raises up a question. How do you introduce a curvature to a straight line if you don't have the handles? Well, another awesome property of this tool is that it's possible to edit the curve super easy and fast with no need to use the handles. If you move the pointer to a section free of nodes, you're gonna see how the icon of the pointer changes and it shows this hand. If you click and drag, you'll see how the curvature moves. Depending on where you grab the curve, the movement will be different. 
This is exactly the same as going handle by handle, fixing up the curb. What's more, you can see both handles adjusting as you move the curb. I strongly recommend you to do most of your editing by using this method because it's way easier, faster and intuitive, even if you do have a bit less control than when using handles. Now let's see why sometimes moving a handle in a curve affects the curve right next to it. In order to make drawing certain shapes easier, it's possible to change the way a node transitions the curvature from one curve to another. You do this by using the right node type. Let me show you. Take a look at these three paths I created. This heart-like shape has these sharp corners and bended lines. Pay attention to the nodes and you'll see that they have these diamond-shaped icons. This icon will indicate you that the nodes are of corner type. With corner type nodes, the curvature won't carry through the node. That is, the curvature in one curve won't affect at all the other curve. Obviously, this type of node is used to create corners, though there is nothing keeping you from trying to create a smooth transition. This type of node is also used for straight curves, since each curve ends in a corner. The final shape is made entirely of smooth surfaces. You can see that they are smooth nodes because they have these square shapes instead of the diamond shapes of the corner nodes. Creating something like this with corner nodes will be a nightmare. Instead, all nodes are set to smooth. A smooth node forces a smooth transition through a node. No matter how much you move it, it's impossible to create a corner using this node type. When you move the handle from one section, the one in the other belonging to the other section moves as well. They are not independent of each other like with the corner type. This type of node you're gonna be using for pretty much everything that's not a corner, since it helps you to make soft and elegant curvatures through a node. At the moment of drawing your path, Inkscape will decide automatically the type of node based on the shape of the path. But if you want full control over the curve after it's been drawn, you need to be able to change a node to any type. If you have selected the node selection tool and check the tool controls bar, you're gonna see a lot of options that aren't important right now, so we are gonna skip them. But these four buttons over here allows you to set the node type of a selected node. But like you've seen in so many cases before in this course, in reality, you'll be using the first two, and you can completely ignore the other two. If you're curious about what the other two do, they change the node type to a small variation of the smooth type. They are rarely needed, so they are not worth your time. The first button is the corner type. When you set a smooth node to this type, nothing appears to happen. But if you pay attention to the icon, you'll see that change to a diamond. Now you can move the handles and the curvature won't get past the node. The second button is the smooth node type. When you set a corner node to smooth, this will introduce a curvature based on the angle of each curve. This is important. Sometimes, rather than start making your path from zero with the pen tool, you'd like to start with a built-in shape. But if you try to modify something with the node selection tool, you see that once you select it, it won't show you the nodes and you can't modify anything. It just shows you the modifiers of that tool. This is because technically these built-in shapes are not paths. They are special tools. So to be able to use them as paths, first it's necessary to transform them to a path. There is a special command that does just that. With the shape selected, go to Object, 
and then object to path. This is gonna transform the object in its current state to an actual path. Now you're gonna be able to see and modify the nodes and curves as if you made it yourself, but you no longer have access to the shape modifiers. Boolean operations are an essential part of most illustrations you'll be doing. They are used to simplify some of the work at the moment of creating some of the more complex shapes. Boolean operations, like the name implies, work by following the classic mathematical Boolean formula, taking two shapes, paths or built-in shapes, as input, and outputs a single path as a result. There are a total of six different types of operations. However, for illustration, you only realistically need three of them. All the other ones aren't really that useful, or not worth the extra energy in learning them. So I'll be skipping those. The union is used to join two or more shapes into a single path. Just select the shapes you want to join and go to Path, Union. Or the really easy to remember shortcut, Control and Plus. This type of operation is mostly used for two things. First, to create organic looking shapes like bushes or clouds by performing a union with a lot of simple objects. The other common use is to create complex mechanical shapes made of simple forms like cogs or robotic parts. The difference operation will take two shapes and the resulting shape will be the shape below minus the area where they intersected. To perform this action, select two intersecting shapes and go to Path, Difference, or the shortcut which is Control minus. You will often use this operation to carve or delete a section out of a shape. The intersection operation is similar to the difference operation, only that it will keep the area where two shapes intersect and delete everything else. To use it, go to Path, Intersection, or the shortcut Control Asterisk. This operation is mostly used to limit a shape to the silhouette of another, often to create shadows or highlights that fit perfectly in a complex silhouette. So as you can see, everything you can do with Boolean operations, you can do manually. But most of the time, it will be really time consuming and tedious. So take your time to get comfortable with each operation, use the shortcuts instead of the menu, and do all the exercises I've left you in the exercise document of this lesson. And this was the last piece of information that you need to be able to create any type of illustration that you may want using Inkshape. Of course, there are a lot of program features I haven't shown you. Tools and commands that are pretty useful but maybe not essential. I strongly recommend you to check the exercise file for this lesson and make them all, more than once if you need it. It will really help you to get everything you've seen in a practical way, so don't skip it. For the next lesson, I want to give you a quick overview of a few features of the program that you could experiment with, as well as showing you a few important tips that I've found to be essential to any type of illustration using Inkshape. In this final lesson, I want to do two things. First, I want to talk very quickly about a few features of the program that we didn't cover because I thought that they weren't essential to most illustrations you'll be doing. And second, I want to give you a couple of what I think are really important tips that will help you avoid a lot of headache in the long run. First, I want to start with an essential tip that I think every Inkscape illustrator should know. I believe that in most tutorials, for the most part, everyone forgets about one of the most important parts of working in Inkscape, switching between the two selection tools. And switching between these two tools is one of the most common actions you'll be doing when drawing. At the end of a day's work, you'll end up wasting a ton of time moving the mouse to the toolbox to switch to the right tool. 
It's a little like when you are learning a 3D program, and everyone tells you that you should get used to the keyboard shortcuts to the manipulator tools as early as possible. Otherwise, you will be forever a slave to moving the mouse all the way to the UI every two seconds. The default shortcuts are a little bit awkward for my taste. The toolbox is set to the function keys, F1, F2, F3. So I prefer to set my own custom shortcuts. You can edit the default shortcuts if you go to Edit, Preferences. Here you go to Interface, Keyboard Shortcuts. The tools are in the context list. Or you can search in the search box. I recommend you to set the selection tools to something like A and S or Q and W. Something that is not as separated from the rest of the default non toolbox keyboard shortcuts. And since you're there, you might as well set a couple of shortcuts to the next most used tools. You'll be using the pen tool a lot, so I recommend you to set a comfortable shortcut for it. And very important, a tool you'll be switching to constantly, the dropper tool. The dropper tool allows you to sample a color and set it to the fill or, if you hold shift, the stroke of the selected object. This tip has to do with the color mode with which you select colors. If you remember, in the fill and stroke dialog, you get to choose from five different modes to select color. In the lesson back then, I told you that you should concentrate in only two modes, the wheel and the HSL mode. The wheel doesn't need explanation, it's just the wheel of colors, where you can see the relationship of colors and then set the saturation and value once you pick the hue. However, I think that you should get comfortable with the HSL mode, since it's the most important to pick in colors for illustration. In art, there is a classical theoretical representation of color that uses three variables, hue, saturation, and value. The hue is the actual color picked, can be blue, green, greenish yellow, etc. The saturation is how pure a color is. The less saturated, the higher quantity of gray that color has. Saturated colors are very vibrant, while desaturated colors are far more pale. Eventually, if you crank down the saturation of a color, you'll reach full gray. Value is how light or dark a particular color is. At no lightness, the color becomes black. The HSL color selection mode, which stands for hue, saturation and lightness, which is the same that value, maps this classic representation. By using this color selection mode, you can compare better the hue, saturation or value of the colors. For example, to imply a surface in shadow, you can sample the color of the surface in light, and then lowering slightly the lightness slider. This type of comparative color selection is something you'll be doing all the time, so I recommend you to get used to handle colors using this mode. Ok, here goes a few of the features of the program that we didn't cover. Some of these features are quite important for some styles or types of illustration, though I wouldn't call any of these features essential to all illustrations. That's why I decided to leave them out. If you think you could use any of these features and would like to know more, I'll leave you in the resources a list with the best links to learn more about Inkscape. Remember when I told you that you could not only add color to an object, but also other types of paint? Well, in common illustration, the other type of paint that you'll most likely use will be the gradient. A gradient is just a way to create a blend between two or more colors in a linear way, often used to generate some subtle effect like the sky changing colors or some basic lighting. In Inkscape, you can create, edit and apply gradients to both the fill and stroke. Gradients are created by using the gradient tool in the toolbox. Then you drag on an object, and this will create two stops. Each stop is going to have a color assigned. To assign it a color, just click on a stop 
and pick a color like you would normally do with a common object. Depending on the options set in the tool controls bar, you create a linear or elliptical gradient. Right next to these options, there are two buttons that allows you to set to what are you going to apply the gradient, to the fill or stroke. You can move the position of both tops. This way you'll be changing the direction of the gradient. And you can do this with either the gradient tool or the node selection tool. It's also possible to add more stops. With the gradient tool selected, double click on any section of this line that joins both stops. If you remember in the objects lesson, I talked about the fill and stroke dialog. And that at the moment of picking a paint type, you get to choose between these 10 little buttons. Well, a few of those were to assign a gradient as a paint. By picking any of those gradient buttons, a few options will appear. But given that most of the options shown in the fill and stroke dialog are also shown in the gradient tool controls, I found that it's not necessary to think about the options in the fill and stroke dialog. In fact, I recommend you to completely forget about them and handle everything through the gradient tool controls. We didn't cover the snap bar. And that's because snapping is not something you'll be using in all your drawings. But it is important and it can help you with some types of illustrations. By clicking in the very first button, you'll enable or disable all the snapping functionality, as I said in the UI lesson. By default, these three buttons should be enabled. This will give you the snapping that you want, so I would recommend you to not touch anything here. If you are feeling adventurous and you want to play around with this bar, you could just leave the mouse on top of a button and get a nice tooltip that will tell you more or less what it does. Once the snapping is enabled, shapes will snap to each other. You'll see this little X just before the shapes move. Snapping works with both objects when you are working with the object selection tool and nodes when you are working with the node selection tool or when you are creating a path with the pen tool. Clipping allows you to limit the visibility of a shape to the silhouette of another. After the clip is done, you can edit the clip shape inside of the node selection tool and no matter what, the changes won't show outside of the silhouette area of the object. In illustration, clips are often used as a more robust way to create shadows and highlights than using the intersection operation. To create a clip, you use two objects. First, the object you want to limit the visibility, or the target object, and then the object that you want to use to limit the other, or the clipping path. The clipping path has to be above the other in the stack order. Then you select them both and go to Object, Clip, Set. Or my favorite method, right click, set clip. Once it's done, these two objects will become a single clip shape, which you can move, scale, rotate, and do pretty much everything you can do with other objects. But now you can edit the shape inside with the node selection tool, and the shape won't show outside of the clipping path. If in the node selection tool you have this button to go on, you can edit the clipping path itself. To unclip, you can go to Object, Clip, Release, or right click, Release Clip. All shapes you edited will keep the changes, whether it's the clipping path or the target shape. There is also a similar feature to clipping called masking. Masking has the same functionality, but with the difference that it has a few transparency features. To me, clipping is simpler, so I prefer to use them over masks. The path effects are modifications that change the behavior or looks of a path. Some of them can be very useful. To open the path effect dialog, go to Path, Path Effects. To add a path effect to a shape, simply click on the plus icon in the Path Effects dialog. This will bring up a list with all path effects available. Now you just select the one you want, 
and the effect will be applied to the shape. It's possible to add effects to built-in shapes, but this may transform them into path depending on the effect. To delete a path effect from a shape, just click in the minus icon. Any modification you did with the effect will be lost. Almost all path effects enables one or more control handles or curves on the shape to manipulate the parameters. You can see and access these controls with the No Selection tool. If the object is selected, then the effect options will be shown in the Path Effect dialog. With an effect active, you can still modify the object and nodes. However, depending on the effect, this may bring buggy and unpredictable behavior. There are a lot of path effects. I couldn't possibly go through all of them. But the truth is that you don't need more than a few for most illustrations. Path effects are something you learn better when you are experimenting by yourself. And that was it for the course. The goal of this course, other than prepare you as fast as possible to take other InkShape dependent courses, was to at least left you wanting to know more about this fantastic and extremely powerful free vector program. I'll leave you in the resources a link with the best free resources I've found to learn and master InkShape. So if you want to know more, now at least you have a strong foundation. I believe that, with what you've learned in this mini course, it's enough for you to go and tackle any of my other InkShape courses. But knowing more of the program will only make you a better and more confident artist. So the time spent learning more about it is never wasted.